whenever you have any type of equipment that you're using, you wanna always take a look at the scaling that's on it. And as we talked about, really there's a couple of sort of things you do wanna sort of figure out. Uh, obviously what the sort of larger markings represent and they usually are the ones that have numbers uh, associated with them. So as we saw last time here, uh, really our larger markings represent uh, one centimeter. Then you do wanna sort of figure out in between those larger markings, uh, how many sort of smaller markings are sometimes referred to uh, that you have. Remember that when you do count these uh, sort of smaller markings, uh, we do typically start with uh, the smallest marking past the last sort of number, if you will. So that's uh, one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. And again, that gives you basically uh, 10 markings in between the big number. And if you're not sure, you know, how to figure out what each one represents, uh, you basically could just take one divided by 10. And that gives you that each one here represents basically 0.1 of a centimeter. Now, once you sort of figure out what the smallest markings are, as we talked about, you usually are able to go uh, one place to the right of the smallest marking in terms of taking a measurement. Uh, you could also figure out the uncertainty in that equipment or the tolerance, if you want to sort of refer to it as that. And you basically could take the smallest marking and divide it by two. We'll give you that. And uh, in this case, if we did that divided by two, we get something like 0 0.05 centimeters. So again, if we did have something like in this range there, this would be 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4. 1 uh, so again, we always record all the certain numbers. So in this case, everybody should agree it is 1.3. Lost my point there. There it is. <laughs> Once again, no matter what type of measurement you take, as we talked about, and as hopefully you saw last time uh, in lab, there's always some degree of uncertainty with that. And that's really where this comes into play. Again, I may look at it and feel it's sort of between the two bigger two dashes and record five centimeters. And if you wanted to include sort of the uncertainty, you could go plus or minus 0 0.005. That's too many zeros there. Get the right number of zeros, 0 0.05 centimeters uh, as the recording. When we do that and we record all the certain numbers, which are the, what these are sometimes referred to, plus that first, uncertain number, which is also sometimes referred to as the estimated digit, uh, that basically represents significant figures as we talked about. So again, as we see here, this number would have three significant figures uh, with the uncertainty lying in that very last significant figure. So the uncertainty does rely or does lie again in the last significant figure I will say probably nine times out of 10, that will be probably the last number written, but you should be aware it's not always the last number written, but it is the last significant figure that is written. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. We're actually gonna, we're gonna talk about the rules for sig figs in about two slides or so. Okay, we'll get to all that, yeah. That hopefully answer your question. If not, let me, let me know. Other questions? Not. Okay, so uh, you always want to record all that certain numbers and that first uncertain number when you do take a measurement. Remember, as we also talked about, uh, even if you were to, for example, hit dead on a dash, in this case, we would have to sort of record the last number as a zero to maintain the right number of significant figures. Uh, again, if we didn't, I guess that would be 1.5, if I drew that right. Uh, we would want to record 1.50 here. That meaning the uncertainty is here at the zero with three significant figures in this case, as they would all be significant. 
Um, and again, what that's basically saying is, I think it could be like 1.51, maybe it's a little less, 1.49, but I think it's somewhere in there. And that's really where the degree of uncertainty comes when we do record the zero, which is what you should do. As we talked about, if you just recorded 1.5 centimeters, that would have only two significant figures where the five would be the uncertain number in this case. And that is basically saying, I think it's 1.5, but it might be 1.6, it might be 1.4. You know, there's a very big sort of range of difference between those numbers. And by dropping that last zero here, you pretty much made your measurement pretty much crappy. So again, always make sure that you record, you know, all the correct significant figures based on the piece of equipment that you're using. Again, when you do this, the helpful thing of this as well is it basically tells you how many decimal places you take it or it should be a whole number. Uh, so wherever that ends up in terms of, you know, 0 0.05 in this case, that's how many decimal places your number should have. Uh, if it ended up at 0.5, you should have one decimal place. Remember again, the last number does not need to always be a five. It could be when you're in measurement, it could be any number you think it is. You know, if you think it's a little bit closer to the next number, it could be like a six, a seven, eight, or nine, uh, but you do need to maintain the right number of sig figs. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Okay. So we talked about uh, last time as well, just look at a couple more examples of some different pieces of uh, equipment. So you got some practice yesterday, hopefully, uh, or on Monday, looking at a graduated cylinder. Remember that when we do measure a liquid, uh, we always wanna look at the meniscus, which is typically that U curvature there. And again, we always wanna kind of read from the bottom of the meniscus. Uh, as we talked about last time, it's really climbing up on the sides because of the attraction between the liquid and the container. Uh, but the true volume there is kind of in the middle on the bottom is really where it's sitting. Sometimes it's easy to see the meniscus. Sometimes it's harder to see the meniscus. Things like graduated cylinders are really good things to use to measure out volume. Uh, things like beakers are really crappy things to use to measure out volume because they have a very big opening and that means the meniscus is pretty much spread out. So even if you look at it and go, hey, I think it's on the 150 milliliter line, uh, you're probably nowhere near 150 milliliters because it's really hard to see because the meniscus is really, really spread out. So you always wanna also make sure that you use the proper uh, pieces of equipment when you are taking measurements and so forth. So here again, if we look at it just between uh, say two numbers, doesn't really matter. We can look here. Our largest markings is uh, 10 milliliters. And in between this, there are 10 markings, which means if we divide that out, each of the smallest markings is one milliliter. And if we take one milliliter and divide it by two, the uncertainty in this piece of equipment is 0.5, which basically tells us that when we take a reading here, we should take it to the first decimal place. And that's what they did here. So once again, uh, right here would be 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, and 36. So we could see that the certain numbers here are 36. Once again, we see 37 is right about there, and they feel that the bottom meniscus is close to the 37. So they record it as their estimated digit or the uncertain digit, uh, basically an eight. And here, this value here would have three significant figures. All three of those would be significant. And we have the plus or minus 0.5, yeah. I'm personally okay if you don't, okay? As long as you record to the proper number of significant figures. Um, as you go on to other chemistry classes, they may want you to do it. Uh, so you do need to know obviously how to do it. But for me, uh, if I asked you what is the reading here, you could just leave, uh, give me 36.8 milliliters, would be perfectly fine. Uh, if I did specifically ask to also include the uncertainty, then you should include it. But as a general rule, I'm okay with not including it. Personally, I feel it gets a little crowded all over the place every time you kind of keep putting those numbers in and stuff like that. But I will uh, let you know, like I said, there are some instructors that do want you to always include it as you go on. Other questions on that? <clears throat> yeah. Now, this is a burette, which is another piece of... Uh, equipment that we do a lot in chemistry. And it's actually a little bit different. We actually uh, fill it here from the top. 
and it actually obviously comes out the bottom. So it releases the liquid out the bottom. So because of that, the scaling on these guys are a little bit different than say like a graduated cylinder. On a graduated cylinder, as we just saw there on the previous slide, basically it goes from zero and then the numbers start to increase as you go down. Because when we use a burette and we fill it from the top, but it comes out the bottom, uh, zero is actually up here, up on top, and the numbers increase as you go down. So you got something like zero, then you got one, then you got two and so forth. And it actually does increase as you go down. So it's really important when you do look at a burette or use a burette like this, uh, what you want to make sure is that you actually are recording properly. So for example, if we had, say a liquid in this ballpark, it is actually two point something, not three point something. Again, it's because the liquid started higher and would be coming down. Yeah. It's very much used for a process which is known as titrations typically. And titrations is basically when you want to add a solution, uh, for example, that's an unknown concentration to something that is a known concentration. Uh, but it's a very, very good piece of equipment to basically add a very specific amount of volume at a time. So basically it has a little down in here, which is referred to as a stopcock. It's basically just a knob that you turn. You can open it, shut it, open it like a faucet, kind of open it, shut it. You could put it add like a stream of liquid. You could add it drop by drop. So it's a very, very um, precise way to add a very specific amount of a liquid. Yeah. Other questions? We'll use them a little bit later on towards the end of the semester when we do some titrations, but um, that's typically what they're used for. Now, um, so in this particular case, if our liquid was here, it would be two point something, not three point something. And you always want to read the scale correctly. A very common mistake that people sometimes make when they use something like this. For example, if the total volume here is 50 milliliters, a 50 milliliter burette, when it's filled to the very top, people record 50. And that's always incorrect. So you always want to record what the actual number says there, not the total volume again, because it actually feels from the top. So if we look at this, this is actually the top of it. This is going towards the bottom. So here we see 28 and then again gets larger as we come down. So in this particular case, the difference between the big units here is one milliliter. There is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten markings between the two, uh, which again, uh, if we divide that by one by 10, we get each little marking is 0.1. The uncertainty here, how far we could take the reading, we could find by dividing our smallest marking by two, which tells us we could take it really to, in this case, two decimal places. And that's where we would want to take it. So in this case, the, uh, Meniscus is, this is 28.5, uh, 28.6, 28.7, and this is 28.9 with the meniscus kind of being in this region here. So they went with 28.85. This would have how many significant figures? It would have four significant figures. And the uncertain number here would be, it would be the five, would be the uncertain or estimated digit. So basically you're saying that, you know, you think it's 28.85, but maybe it's 28.86 or 28.84, but it's in that ballpark of where it's at. Question on that. Yeah. Typically speaking, most burettes, that's usually how far you should take the reading. They're usually kind of set up like this and two uh, decimal places is typically on a majority of your that you would use is usually what you want to take it. Any questions on that? <clears throat> All right, so there's a zoom button. All right, so why don't you give this one a go and see what you come up with. What would be the proper reading here based on the scaling that you actually see there? Once again, this is a burette, so it does increase, as you can see, as you go from the top. Let's 
Once again, I'm just going to go above where the liquid is just to get an idea. That's 10 and that is 20. That means that my large markings here is uh, going to be 10 milliliters. If I count up the markings here, we got one, we got two, we got three, we got four, we got five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 markings. So 10 divided by 10 means each of the smallest markings uh, represents one milliliter in this case. Any questions on that? <clears throat> Again, to figure out really how far, we can usually go one more place to the right, or we could just divide our smallest markings by two, and that will tell us that as well. We divide that by two, which means we could really take this to 0.5 milliliters are really the first decimal place. So now we want to figure out kind of where it is. So this big guy here is 20. I kind of scribbled out the 21 there. Bless you, the 22 right there, 23, 24, and 25. So really the meniscus here is like dead on 22 in this case. So I should record this as 22.0 milliliters. Again, we do need the zero because on this piece of equipment, we could actually take it to the first decimal place, which obviously our uncertainty being plus or minus 0 0.5 milliliters. So it looks like D perhaps. How many significant figures does this number have? It does have three. The uncertain number here is the it is the zero in this case, yeah. And again, the reason we do need to keep the zero is because we have the ability to do so on this piece of equipment. If we got rid of the zero and just recorded, say, 22 like B here, how many sig figs would that have? The uncertain number in this case would be the, the second two, right? Which tells us, I think it may be 23 or 21, a much larger room for error than really what it should be based on this piece of equipment. So again, as I mentioned, why it's important not to just get rid of numbers. You wanna make sure you always take it to the proper number of readings. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, so basically a burette, uh, when you fill it, you fill it from the top, right? So basically as you fill it, basically all the water or whatever liquid gets filled all the way to the top. Now, unlike a graduated cylinder where you'll just take it and pour it out from the top where you also fill it, here it actually comes out the bottom. So basically as you open this, what you'll start to see is the liquid will start to drain this way. Yeah, so it's basically running out the bottom. And that's why at the top is actually zero and it does start to increase as you go down because uh, when you fill it all the way to the top, you're at zero. So typically when you take, use a burette, there's basically two things that you do. You take like an initial reading and you take a final reading. So after you open and shut it, you take a final reading. So let's say for example, we had to fill it filled all the way up here to zero to start with. We would take an initial reading of zero point and this guy was uh, here, I think. Now let's say we opened it up for a while and it started to drain and it drained all the way down to, we'll say we hit right at 10, the 10 marking at that point. Our final volume here would be 10 milliliters. So by knowing the initial and the final volume reading on the burette, we know exactly we added how much here. We could find the volume added as just subtracting our final minus our initial, which would be 10 milliliters minus zero, means that we added 10 milliliters in this case. So that's the purpose of it. So for example, let's say then we decided, well, we need to add more. So we wanna add, just a little bit more. So let's say we took another initial reading at this point of 10 milliliters, and we added a little bit more until it got to, just keep nice whole numbers, 15 basically, right? My final was 15. In this second adding, did I add a total of 15 or how much did I actually add? We only added five. So by taking those two readings, we now know that at the second time we added some volume, we took 15 minus 10, which means in that case, we only added five. Total though, we have added 15 between the two different ones. So that's typically what you use a burette or how you use a burette. There's always, you always wanna take an initial reading where you start, a final reading where you end, and it basically will tell you how much you added in that case. And again, it's, it's 
it increases as you go down because it's basically coming out the bottom at right at the bottom. Exactly. So the, really the difference where, where you start and where you ended, however long you open and shut it type of thing, you take the difference there and it tells you basically how much you added. Yeah. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> okay. Questions on how to take proper measurements. Yeah. Yeah. Then let's talk officially about how to sort of count significant figures, uh, the rules to follow. All right, so let's talk about a few things. First off, when we have a measurement or a number, any non-zero number is considered to be significant. Uh, so you basically would count all non-zero numbers. When we start counting, here's the deal, and you want to count you know, how many significant figures there are in a number, we always start on the left-hand side and go to the right. And you do not start counting until you hit the very first non-zero. So as soon as you hit the very first non-zero from left to right, that's when you should start counting. So in this particular case here, as soon as I hit the one, that is a non-zero. So I will start counting the one, the two, the five, and the nine are all non-zero. So they're all significant. So this guy would have four significant figures. If this was a measurement, the uncertain number would be, or the estimated number would be the the nine in this case, yeah. <clears throat> now it's the zeros that give people sort of a difficult time. And there's really three types of zeros that we come across. The first zero is a leading zero. So those are all the zeros that come before you hit the very first non-zero number. They are not significant. So once again here, we're going to start left. That's a zero, that's a zero, that's a zero right there at the four is our very first non-zero number. So that's when we should start counting. So the four and the nine are both non-zeros. So this number only has two significant figures in this case. Once again, if this was a measurement, it would be the nine that would be the estimated digit in this particular case. You could have 4,000 zeros before you hit the first non-zero they would all be not significant. <clears throat> the next type of zero is sometimes referred to as a cap zero. It is a zero that's basically trapped, so sometimes also called trapped zeros, uh, between two non-zero numbers. Those are always going to be significant. So if we start here, left to right, we hit a, which tells we should start counting. The two zeros here are trapped between non-zeros, which makes them significant. And the four at the end is also a non-zero. So in this case, can figures. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> now, probably the zero that gives people the worst time or the hardest time is the zeros that come at the end. And these are sometimes referred to as trailing zeros. They can be significant or they may not be significant. What determines whether or not the zeros at the end are it is, is there a decimal point anywhere in the number? So it doesn't have to be near the zero, but if there's a decimal point anywhere in that number, it makes all the zeros at the end significant. If there is not a decimal point, then the zeros at the end are not significant. So for example, we have 600 written like this. We start counting here which is a non-zero, so that is one significant figure. There is no decimal point written. Even though occasionally we sometimes assume there should be one at the end, but frankly, there is not one actually written, bless you. So we will not see it there. So in this case, it has only one significant figure, which would be the six in this case. Now, if we wrote, say the same thing like this, 600, and we did put the decimal point there, this number now would have three significant figures. They're kind of significant. These zeros that come at the end are significant because there's a decimal point in that number. <clears throat> so if you had something like 0 0.0001003240000, 0, how many significant figures if we had some type of measurement like that? I have no idea. I was just writing numbers. So let's see. We have 
if we go through it. All these zeros here, are they significant? They're not significant. And sometimes people go, well, don't those zeros come after the decimal point? The problem with that is you have not hit the first non-zero. So you can't start counting until you hit the very first non-zero, which happens actually right there at the one, yeah? Now that we hit the first non-zero, bless you, we're gonna start counting. Up until that point, all those zeros are considered leading zeros. So until you hit that very first non-zero, they're considered leading zeros. Uh, the two zeros here are significant because they're trapped. This guy is significant, significant, significant. Now we come to the zeros at the end. Are they significant? The answer is yes, because way over here, there is a decimal point in this number. So all those zeros at the end would be significant. And I have no idea how many that is, but it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 significant figures in this case. Any questions on that? <laughs> Now, as I talked about before, when we do write a number in scientific notation that we also talked about last time, any number that comes before the times 10 part is always significant. So this number would have three significant figures. So why is significant scientific notation good? Let's say I needed to give my answer to two significant figures, and that was the answer on the calculator. I could simply write 1.3 times 10 to the three, and now I have two significant figures. So as I mentioned before, sometimes you may come across a situation where the only way to kind of give the answer to the correct number of significant figures is to write in scientific notation. Because frankly, in scientific notation, you can control how many significant figures there are by just writing the correct amount before the times 10 part. So any number before the times 10 part, always significant. So let's say I had 12,000 written like this. Which is, what number is the uncertain number, the estimated digit? Is it the zero? How many significant figures does this number have? It does have two, which means one and two which means the uncertain number is actually, actually the two. So this is what I was talking about last time. In most cases, the estimated digit or the uncertain digit is usually the last number, but it's not always the last number is written, but it is always the last significant figure that is written. So in this case, the two is really the last significant figure in this case, and that would be where your estimated digit. This is not the greatest if this was a measurement because that's basically saying, I think it's 12,000, but maybe it's 13,000 or 11,000. That's a pretty big window of maybe in between that. So it's not the greatest measurement, obviously, because it only has two no configures. Okay, well, we want to write this number. We want to write this number three significant figures. What should it be? Yeah, so. You can't do this, right? Is that three significant figures? No, it's actually still two significant figures, right? And there's also a very big difference, right? Between 12,000 and 120, right? We're gonna talk about rounding and things like we shouldn't round crazily like this, right? Because like if I owed you $12,000 and said, here, I'll give you three significant figures, here's 120, you're probably not gonna be happy with me, right? And so. We never, when we want to round or try to get things right, sig figs, never want to change the actual meaning, right, of the number. So really in this way, you can't put a decimal point here, right, because it now has five significant figures. Nor can you put a decimal point here. A is now 120, right, it's no longer 12,000, and it also has five significant figures as well. So in this case, the only way that you could, if you were told, take this number to three sig figs, is you would have to write it as 1.20, and we would go one, two, three, four places, times 10 to the fourth. Now this number has three significant figures. It also has really the same value or meaning as the original number. And that's a really important thing. 
sometimes people get crazy with the sig figs because you always should give it to the right sig figs but they just start lopping off numbers to get to the right number of sig figs and you end up changing the meaning of the number or the value you never want to do that other questions on that <clears throat> now are some numbers uh, which are considered exact numbers and exact numbers are pretty much found in two ways here. Uh, one way are pretty much anything that you would count. So if you had like five apples in a, the classic example, I think, in textbook, five apples in a basket, you're not going to find some scientific way to figure out how many apples you have. You're just going to simply count it, right? So counting is considered an exact number. More often, the way that we come across things that are exact are things like these guys here definitions which by the way these is a good little page here that you should know these probably uh, for example one inch is 2.54 centimeters exactly that's considered a definition uh, one pound is 453.6 grams one foot is 12 inches hopefully you know that three feet in a yard if you're watching football and one mile 1.609 kilometers so these are all exact sort of definitions uh, it's an equality and the quality, as we'll talk about, is basically two values that are different units, but represent the same amount of something, right? So if you have a length that's one foot, that's the same if you have a length that's 12 inches, right? They represent the same sort of length, just on different units. So what is the deal with uh, sort of exact numbers? The deal with exact numbers is they can pretty much have <laughs> unlimited number of significant figures. They could have as many significant figures as you want. So really what happens when we do come across an exact number in a calculation, uh, we ignore it. So we don't worry about the significant figures. If it is an exact number um, in a calculation, um, if it's not an exact sort of definition, then we should look at the significant figures, those sort of definitions. But if it's considered a definition, um, it's considered an exact number. <clears throat> so usually if you have some type of sort of, we talk about two different types of units. If you have sort of a metric to metric sort of conversion, that's usually always considered an exact number. You have sort of an English to English sort of, like in inches and feet, those are considered exact that type of things. A couple ones that cross over, like uh, an inch is 2.54 centimeters, a pound is 453.6 grams exactly. Um, but other than that, if you kind of cross over the units, like if you have a metric unit to an English unit or back and forth. Typically those are not considered exact numbers and you should look at the significant figures in the calculation. But a lot of times, most of it will be sort of considered an exact number. And really what that means is you don't have to worry about it for a calculation. <clears throat> All right. All right, so for each of these, how many significant figures do each of these have here? Take a moment or two here and let's figure it out. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so here, remember, we want to go left to right, and we're not going to start counting until we hit the very first non-zero. That means all those zeros that came before are not going to be significant. So that three is going to be significant. The zero is trapped, so it will be significant. And the four will be significant. So we got three sig figs in this case. Yeah. Questions on that one there. <clears throat> this is a number that is written in scientific notation, which means all of these numbers here before the times 10 part are significant. So this would have four sig figs. Now, sometimes people on this deal want to go, all right, it's like two, so I'm just going to convert it back to a number and write that and go, it has three significant figures. The reason is written in scientific notation like that and has a zero there is because the zero is significant. So you should always look at it in terms of the significant figures on scientific notation. By the way, if you go from uh, decimal form, if you will, to scientific notation or back, you should never lose any significant figures. So if you remember, for example, we had a crazy one like I think uh, 5, 2, 3, 8, 5, 6. And when I turned it into scientific notation by doing this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I kept 
all these numbers. The reason I kept all these numbers is this number has how many significant figures? One, two, three, four, five, six. This number has how many significant figures? One, two, three, four, five, six. So you never want to lose significant figures as you go for scientific notation to decimal or back. Also, if we had something like this guy. This number has how many significant figures? It does have four, which are these, which means when I turn it into scientific notation, one, two, and three, I need to keep all of them. Once again, do not lose any significant figures as you go back and forth. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> okay, uh, next one is for all. This one would have just one in this case. There's a zero, but there's no decimal point written. So the zero at the end is not, which means it has a significant figure. That means a certain number in this number is one. It is the one. The one's both the certain and the uncertain number, really, in this case. It was really the uncertain number. Again, you're basically saying, I think it's 10, but it could be like 20 or zero. So it's, again, a pretty bad measurement, right? Just a big room for error. This guy here would then have four. We won't start counting until the nine. Decimal point there. Once again, it does not need to be near it. You wouldn't do that, and uh, you really wouldn't do that. Base, well, I, I guess when we were this right, I guess you would not probably do that because when you would look at the uncertainty or tolerance, you know, when we like divided by two, it would tell you really how far you should take it. So, you know, if you could only take it to the for example, the whole number, you might put the decimal point in that case. You know, if this, you know, if the tolerance was to the whole number, that way it would keep that number perhaps significant, right? That zero significant. Uh, if you did it and said you should go to the first decimal place, you obviously put the decimal and then the zero at the end. So it really does depend on the piece of equipment. Yeah. <clears throat> Other questions? All right. Uh, so here's, again, difference between measured and exact. Obviously, if a patient weighs 154 pounds, 55 pounds, uh, that was some type of measurement that was done. Um, <clears throat> if a basket holds eight apples, again, that would be something that would be counted, which would be considered an exact number. One kilogram is a thousand grams. This is really a metric to metric sort of equality. So that's going to be a definition or exact. And here, the distance there is 1,720 kilometers. That obviously would be something that was measured. <clears throat> so we talk a little bit about rounding. Again, uh, if the first digit is sort of less for less, we basically just drop the rest of the digits. Normal rounding applies. If it's greater, if it's five or greater, then we do round up and we hit it upon it a little bit earlier. Um, 13,333, I want uh, two sig figs. What should it be 13? Should it be 13,000? Should it be 1.30 times 10 to the fourth? 1.3 times 10 to the fourth. Which are good, which ones are bad? Let's we'll start with this one. Although it is two significant figures, once again, if I owed you $13 and gave you 13, not really the same thing, right? So again, we don't want to do extreme rounding. Yes. This one is okay. This is 13 two significant figures, right? 13,000, 13,333, essentially the same number. Right? Really change it all that much. Maybe give me the $333. One, good. Good. Two significant figures, right? Still represents about 13,000, so we really didn't change the number. Good or bad? Bad, because it tells how many significant figures. That's great. On that. 
<laughs> like I said, it's a very common mistake. You know, people try to get the right sig figs and they just start lopping things off. And again, you never want to change that meaning of the number. Yeah. Uh -huh. it, yeah, so when you want to write proper scientific notation, like we talked about last time, it does have to be a number between one and 10. So you got to move the decimal right or left, whichever way to get you to a number that's between one and 10, can't be more than 10, can't be less than one, but it's got to be a number between that. So that's how many, how many places you would move the decimal place. If your question is, how do you know it should be two sig figs or three sig figs? That's the next slide. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Because I specifically wanted to write the answer with two significant figures. Well, in, yeah, in this particular case, if we looked at this, the way it's written here, it has how many significant figures? It has five, right? Now, if I'm looking to get to two, that really takes me to this three, right? Which means when I'm looking in terms of rounding, I wanna look at the next number, right? And the next number is less than five. So we'd basically just drop those numbers off. In this case, we can't drop the numbers completely off, otherwise it becomes 13 and changes the value. So we need to keep those zeros as sort of placeholders, if you will, to maintain the value of it. Um, and, but we essentially kind of drop those numbers off. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, so no extreme rounding. So round each of these to two sig figs. So take a moment to look. Uh, so two sig figs is what we're shooting for. So first significant figure, second significant figure. We look at the next number, so seven. So it's above five. So this should be 36 meters in this case. Coming to our next one, significant figure, two significant figures. So looking at the next number, which is a two. So we're going to drop it here. And this should be three, eight, zero, zero. Do I put a decimal point? I do not, otherwise they, they become significant. So it should look something like that. You obviously could also have done scientific notation if you liked one, two, three places. And that would have been okay as well. Now, any questions on those two? I mean, here, once again, we're not going to start counting until we hit our first non-zero, which is there. Our next one would be our second uh, significant figure. So we're going to look at this number, uh, which, again, is lower than two. Uh, so in this case, it would be 0 0.0026 liters. In this case, why didn't I just put zeros at the end? they would then become significant, right? And then you'd obviously have more than two significant figures in this case. So in this case, we do completely drop them. Doesn't change the meaning of the number, uh, but also keeps the right number of sig figs. You obviously could also do scientific notation on this one if you liked one, two, and negative three. You rather went that way. <clears throat> Lastly here, second significant figure right there, that is an eight. So we're going to round up and do a 1.3 kilograms. Any questions on any of those there? Questions on sig figs, rounding. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about sig figs and really the important part of it, which is calculations that involve significant figures. So we talked a little bit about in lab the other day, but officially here, if you are multiplying or dividing, so doing either one, your answer should have the same number of significant figures as whichever number has the least number of significant figures. So when you're multiplying or dividing, you're looking at significant figures and whichever one is the smallest is how many significant figures you should have. So if we had uh, 4.300 times 1.2, this number has four significant figures. This number has two significant figures. That means your answer should end up with two significant figures. And again, works the same way. Obviously, if you are dividing, you got a bunch of numbers, whichever one is the smallest number of significant figures is exactly how many sig figs your answer should have. When you add and subtract, it's actually a little bit different. 
you're not looking at significant figures. You're actually looking at decimal places. And it's whichever one has the smallest number of decimal places is how many decimal places your answer should have. So for example, if I have 1.322 plus 0 0.44 plus 1.2, I'm gonna try it without my calculator, we'll see. <laughs> that's a two, that's a six. Uh, that is a nine and that is a two. What should the right answer here be? So here we're adding, so we're looking at decimal places. This guy's got three decimal places. This guy's got two decimal places. This guy has one decimal place. The smallest number of decimal places is one. So that is where the answer should have. And now I should do what? I should round. So the answer here should actually be 3.0 has one decimal place. By the way, you should not be confused because it does have one decimal place, but how many significant figures does 3.0 have? Two, yes, yeah, so make sure you don't get those two confused, yeah? And that may be important if you take that number and go do something else with it, yeah? Question, so they are both the smallest, except that multiplying and dividing, you look at the smallest number of sig figs, adding and subtracting, you look at the smallest number of decimal places, you should always keep track of your significant figures when you're doing calculations. Your calculator may not give you the right number of significant figures. You also should avoid rounding until the very end. So if you're doing a bunch of calculations in a row, like you get an answer, do another calculation, get an answer, do another calculation with it. You really should sort of avoid rounding till the end, but you should always keep track of your significant figures. So for example, if we combo things together here, like 3.25 times 1.7, and then I divide it by 3345, how many significant figures should the answer have? So we're doing a couple of different things, right? So first off, we typically in math would do the division part or the parentheses part first, which means we're multiplying. That is three significant figures times two significant figures, which means up on top, you should have two significant figures. Then you're going to be dividing it by the bottom number that has four significant figures. So your answer should end up with two significant figures when it's all said and done. So you do wanna keep track of it. Uh, so in this case, if we did it, I would take 3.25, I would times it by 1.7, hit equals, divided by 3345. And it looks like you'll end up with 0 0.00165.1718. Keeping track of it means we should end up here. We should look at this number, which means our answer should actually be 0 0.0017 would be the proper number of significant figures. So sometimes you combo those steps. You just want to do the proper mathematical operation first and get your answer. So let's say we had. Uh, Let's say we had uh, 4, 4.44 4. times 1, 2, 3 divided by 6, 6, 7, 8, 5. And then I want to add 1.777 7, 7 to it. What should the right answer be? I don't know either. I just made up numbers. I'm going to hope for the best. Let's all do it real quick here. So that's going to give us 44.44 times one, two, three. Gives us a number of 5466.12, I believe. Technically speaking, significant figure wise, how many significant figures should there be in that answer if you were to give that as the answer? Yeah, based on the operation here, this guy's got four significant figures, this guy's got three, which means really it should have three significant figures, which takes you there. Personally, you might want to keep track of it. Some people like to put a little line above it. I don't really care to do so, but you can if you want. But personally, I would keep the whole number in my calculator and then divide it by the bottom number, which is 66785. And that gives us, when we do the division part here, 0 0.0818. 
four, six, five, two, two on her calculator. I obviously then took a number when I divided three significant figures by five, which means really my answer here should have how many significant figures? Should have three, which would take me to here, right? So that's really the number that I'm going to then add to this guy, right? And when I add it to that guy, 1.777, we end up with how many, how far should I take this to? Should take it to, now I'm adding, right? Is the last thing I'm doing. This guy has how many decimal places? This one has, the answer should end up with three, yeah? So 0 0.0818 plus 1.777, guess that worked out. So we should end up with three. 1.8588 is what's on the calculator if you just do that. So we should then round up 1.859. So if you're doing multiple steps, you want to kind of keep track of it. I, again, would not round to the end, but you definitely should kind of keep track. Sometimes people like to put the little above. You can do that if you want. I personally would just keep a few digits if you needed to write the number down past the significant figure that you need. Uh, but you do need to kind of keep track of it as you go through it. Any questions on that there? All right, questions on how to do calculations involving significant figures. If you come across something that is an exact number, you don't have to worry about the sig figs. You pretty much just ignore it. So you don't just go to anything that is not an exact number, and that's what you want to look at. <laughs> any questions on any of that there? Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about actually is density. And the density of an object uh, compares really the mass to volume. I guess I should really undo that so you can see it. It'll be good. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so again, here, uh, the density uh, is basically the mass to the volume of an object. We look at the density, and, and it helps us determine things like, you know, will something sink or float? If something is more dense than water, what will happen to it? Will it sink or float? It will sink, right? And if it's less dense than water, it will float, right? <clears throat> if I throw a Diet Coke can and a Coke can into a thing of water, like a sink of water, will they both sink? Will they both float? Will one do one, one do the other? Actually, that's what will happen is the Coke will sink, Diet Coke will float. Yeah. Reason for that is Coke has what in it? Has more sugar. Diet Coke has artificial sugar. Good party trick in case you need one. Yeah. So uh, the Diet Coke will float. The regular Coke will sink because of the sugar. Uh, we can calculate density. Density is equal to mass over volume. And you do need to know this formula and the different ways to rearrange it. So density is mass over volume. Volume would be mass divided by density. And mass would be volume times density. Sometimes people like to remember the DMV triangle. Density is mass over volume. Volume is mass over density. And mass is density times volume. Typical units for density is grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeters. As we talked about last time, a cubic centimeter is the same thing as a milliliter, is a one-to-one -one conversion. Remember that we get a cubic centimeter by cubing the volume measurements, right? And that's basically the length times the width times the height, like you took those measurements the other day, or thickness, whatever you want to call it. Um, those three different length measurements, when you multiply them together, you get a volume, and again, uh, if you measure it in centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, gives you your cubic centimeter. For gases, density is typically given in grams per liter. Uh, we really won't uh, calculate too much of density of gases, but when you get it to 1A, you'll do that and when you get to the gas chapter. but. Uh, most of the time, the units that we'll see will be grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter is typically the units that we will see. So clearly, you could get the volume by taking the length measurements like we talked about. You could also get the volume by just filling the solution in a 
graduated cylinder and just taking a volume reading. So why don't we try one here? What is the density of a block that has a volume of 25.3 cubic centimeters and a mass of 21.C? So density is mass divided by volume. So obviously this is a volume and that is our mass. So really just got to plug it in there. So that's gonna be 21.7 grams divided by 25.3 cubic centimeters. When I do that, 21.7 divided by 25.3 gives me on my calculator 0 0.85770750509. First off, does the units cancel here? They do not. So the units remain. It is grams, keeps the number, and cubic centimeters. Should I give that as my answer? I should not. Here I just divided, which means I'm looking at significant figures or decimal places. Significant figures. Top number has three significant figures. Bottom number has three significant figures, which means my answer should go to three significant figures. I should look at the number to the right, and I also should round, right? So I should end up at 0 0.858 grams per cubic centimeter. Any questions on that there? So again, we do wanna keep track of our significant figures and also our units. We wanna make sure we have units in the calculation that we do and also in our answer. Any questions? <clears throat> Now, we talked about two ways to get a volume, which I just mentioned. You could just frankly fill up a graduate cylinder or something like that, take a volume reading. Uh, you can, as we talked about, and you did, and we'll do again today, take three different measurements and get a volume reading. The other way we get a volume reading very common with density is what's known as volume by displacement. So if we had a graduated cylinder, that had a certain amount of volume in it, initial volume, and we put something that is solid into it, what will happen to the liquid in the graduated cylinder? Will it go down, will it go up, will it stay the same? It should go up, right? So we'll go up for our final volume with our guy in there. Now, the object will actually displace a volume that is equal to its own volume. So we could find the volume of the object by taking the difference between those two volume readings. So the volume of the object, which is a very common way, and you'll do it today in lab, we take our final volume minus our initial volume, and that will give us the volume basically of the object. So it's a very convenient way to just like throw something into some water or something like that, take a couple of volume readings, and you can find the volume of that object. <clears throat> By the way, if I had... Uh, different liquids in a container that had different densities, where would the lowest density be in these different layers? The one with the lower density or smallest density should be, right? The guy with the higher density should be bottom layer, right? The different liquids will separate out based on their densities. If you throw something in there and it gets stuck right about there, that means it is more dense than what's above it, right? But less dense than what is below it, right? So, um, you know, those are some other things that may happen. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so that's what we see in this picture uh, before she jumps in. That's our initial volume. When she goes in, she will displace the liquid to the final volume. And once again, if you take the difference between those two volumes, that will really give you the volume of her. I hope that's not just markings, also a ladder. Otherwise, she's got to hold her breath for a while, I imagine. But hopefully, she'll get out. All right. So why don't we try one here? A student fills a graduated cylinder to 25 milliliters with a liquid. She then puts a solid in it. The liquid rises to 33.9 milliliters. The mass of the solid was 63.5. What is the... Okay, let's take a look. So it's kind of the same situation we just were talking about. So we basically have a graduated cylinder. It's got 25 milliliters of water in it. We're gonna take a solid and throw it in there. After she does so, it rises to 
33.9. So obviously we're looking for the density, which is mass divided by volume. We have the mass given to us, so we have that. We do need to find the volume by displacement here. So the volume of the object would be our final volume minus our initial. So that would be 33.9 milliliters minus 25 milliliters, going to give us 8.9 milliliters as our volume. So now we have the volume. So all that's left really is to plug it in there. So our density here would be our mass, which was 63.5 grams, divided by our volume, which is 8.9 milliliters. And I get on my calculator 7.1348.31461. Once again, the units will not cancel. What should the answer be here? It should be 7.1 grams per milliliter. That is because here, based on our subtraction, we look at decimal places, which is one decimal place, one decimal place. So one decimal place gives that number two significant figures. The number up on top has three significant figures. Now we're dividing. So we're looking at significant figures here. And the one with the smallest number of significant figures is two. And that is how we do end up as 7.1 two significant figures at the end. So again, you do need to keep track of the significant figures as you're doing the calculations there. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> There's a table of uh, some densities. One thing that you should know by heart is the density of liquid water is one gram per milliliter, which is right about there. I will tell you that in reality, uh, density does change with temperature. So the density of water will change with temperature. But for the most part, if you ever come across a question and you're like, I think I need the density of water, but they didn't give it to me, pretty safe to go with the one gram per milliliter. Uh, unless specifically they say it's some different temperature, they would probably give you the different value. But it does change with temperature, but one gram per milliliter is something you should know for liquid water um solid and stuff it's actually a little bit different right <clears throat> um solid water right which is also known as ice actually is more or less dense than liquid water it's less dense right we put our ice in our soda cups right or our drinks right they end up on top and that's because when the water molecules come together and they hydrogen bond together when they come together in the solid state, it creates a lot of really open spaces between the different water molecules. And because it creates a lot of open spaces between the different water molecules in the ice version, that raises the volume and then the density goes down. So actually water is kind of an unusual substance in that sense. Most substances in their solid form is actually more dense than their liquid form. But water is an exception to that uh, because it does create a lot of these really open spaces increases sort of the volume overall of the ice and actually is less dense, which again is why it floats. <clears throat> Any questions on that? All right, I think we'll lay it up there. I think that 